To say you gotta know somebody Or know somebody To get somewhere these days To say you know that's alright Yeah, that's alright Cause you know that's alright with me Yeah, you know that's alright Yeah, that's alright Cause you know that's alright With tons of free information and tools for real estate investors Today we're very excited to have Phil Falcone with us and I hope that you will grab some pen and paper real quick so you can take some notes. We've got a great call lined up for you today. As always, the views expressed on these interviews are the views of the speakers and do not represent legal or financial advice, so please seek your own counsel. Phil, you with us? Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the call, Tim. Glad you could make it. Um, for the listeners, Phil's going to be talking about Subject 2 today, and I want to tell you a little bit about Phil's background. He's actually been an investor for a very long time, he started investing at the age of 23 and has been doing real estate investment for over 20 plus years now. And he still is on a daily search for the, the next great deal. So he's, as he's uh, a self described addict, and I'll let him tell you more about, about that in just a minute. He is uh, from the Philadelphia area. He's a full time real estate investor. And his portfolio today includes commercial offices, apartment buildings, and residential homes. And he's constantly looking for real estate to increase his portfolio size. He is the author of a book, which I'll let him tell you about. He also produces a web TV show. And, Phil, if you would, can you kind of tell us, fill in the holes for us and tell us kind of how you got started and how you got to where you are today, please? Well, uh, the title of my book is Addicted to Real Estate, and it's just a true statement of uh, my life in the real estate business. I fell in love with this business uh, as a teenager. I came from a family of entrepreneurs that uh, my mother ran three businesses, my father ran his own business, and I kind of grew up just knowing that I was going to be an entrepreneur and be in business for myself one day. And the real estate business just resonated with me because of the first word in real estate. It's real. You can see it. You can touch it. You can renovate it. You can have a personal impact in your own investment. So that's what really appealed to me. And as soon as I was capable to buy my first house at the age of 23, I got into this business and I got into it uh, swinging like crazy. I just uh, I just started buying like crazy in 1989 and kept going and never quit. And to this day, I'm still addicted to real estate. All right. If you and if you don't mind sharing, can you um, share how many deals or maybe a dollar amount that you've done to date? Uh, you know, I lost track a long time ago. Uh, you know, uh, my, my my whole philosophy, my whole uh, goal in real estate business is to build up the largest portfolio I can possibly have. So, uh, you know, at this point, by the time this, this, this uh, recent downsurge is over, you know, I expect to have a, a portfolio uh, north of $20 million that I'm holding for myself and uh, and hopefully enjoying enormous profits in the future. So setting myself up for life is really what I'm focusing on. Okay. And if, you, if you're willing to share, on, on the sub-two deals, what's your average profit? Uh, a lot of the deals that I do for subject to, you know, the buy-and-hold type deals, uh, I'm not really flipping the properties, and I'm not wholesaling them. I am a buy and hold guy all the way. So I use subject to as one of the techniques to acquire properties and to build my portfolio. So sometimes uh, I pick up a house with no profit, and the only thing I get out of it is I get a house that's now part of my portfolio that cash flows. Uh, other times I, um, I figure out ways where I can get paid on subject twos. For example, I'll acquire a house and there'll be some private money that has to be injected into the deal in order to get it done. Uh, I would do a strategy I call wholesaling to yourself, where I tell the private lender I'm borrowing a little more than I need and get paid on that extra amount that I needed. And uh, another way would be uh, sometimes I'll, I'll do equity partnering where I'll sell a piece of a house that I bought subject to to somebody else, and I'll get paid with their down money. So, I mean, it ranges from zero to $100,000 on a deal. Um, I could give you a couple of examples about it, but there's really no average to it that makes any sense. Okay, yeah, I understand that. So let me, for those that are not familiar with the technique itself, would you mind spending a few minutes kind of describing um, the basics of buying subject to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's the way I always love to start a conversation on it. I mean, really, what is subject to, okay? 
When you buy a house subject to, you're basically saying, normally in a normal deal, in a conventional kind of deal, you're buying the house free and clear of all encumbrances. You're, you're paying off existing mortgages, you're getting the new financing, you're bringing that to the table, and at the settlement, you are resolving all existing liens and encumbrances and creating new ones. Well, when you buy a house subject to a mortgage, you're basically buying it, and the mortgage that the seller has already obtained, that is already in their name, you're going to leave that mortgage there. So you're essentially buying the house subject to the terms of the existing liens and encumbrances. Right? And that's really what it means. Now, you can buy houses. Imagine if how many houses you could buy if you could just walk around and buy people's homes that already come with all the financing. Well, I mean, as many as you can, can grab is, is usually the answer to that. How many would you buy? If you could buy them with none of your own money, you'd, you'd buy them all. You'd buy almost all of them. That's kind of the attitude that I have. But there are many other things that people don't realize. You can buy houses subject to other things as well. Uh, for example, let's just say that uh, I'm buying a house subject to a mortgage, and there also happens to be a... $6,000 wood and sewer lien on the house, okay? You could actually uh, buy the house subject to that lien. Not every lien, not every encumbrance has to be paid off at the settlement table. And, uh, for example, uh, I bought a house once that had a $6,000 wood and sewer lien on it. And uh, I felt as if I had an excellent chance of negotiating with the wood and sewer company because this particular situation, uh, a pipe had broken. The meter was actually uh, inside of like a shed that wasn't heated, and the pipe had frozen and broken just after the meter. And uh, I called up the, uh, I, I bought the house subject to the lien, and then I called up the um, water and sewer company, and I showed them pictures of it. And I said, listen, you know, this thing was never properly installed right, and on your bill you charge for water usage, and you charge for sewer usage, Okay. I said, well, the, the water from this particular meter ended up spilling outside of the house. It, it just got, uh, you know, poured into the ground, so you actually never did the sewer portion of the water sewer bill. And based on that general idea, I got them to reduce the bill uh, two-thirds down to $2,000. So it just goes to show you that you don't want to just accept uh, every, every loom that's on a house. You can take it over subject, too. And, and, and as funny as this sounds... I mean, think about it, water and sewer. Like, if you if you drink water at your house, but you go to the bathroom at somebody else's house, your water and sewer bill is not reflected accurately. So, <laughs> just, you know, I'm trying to make a point that you can, you can have legitimate negotiations over bills where you question the accuracy of those bills. Here's another great thing that you can take over is uh, what's going on today with a lot of people's mortgages? Loan modifications. People who are the owners of homes, they have the opportunity to get some pretty amazing loan modifications today. And some of these people have rates there, 2%, for example. Now, if you come across a house that has a 2% mortgage, even if you had intentions of buying this house for cash, you've got to stop in your tracks and go, wait a minute, why would I ever want to pay off a 2% mortgage and replace it with a 5%? You wouldn't want to. So you need to start thinking outside the box and figure out another way to buy that house where that existing beautiful loan of 2% stays in place. Uh, I, I once bought a house subject to a lawsuit. Uh, <clears throat> the seller of this house uh, had apparently uh, a lien filed against his house for $7,000, and it was over a baseball. Apparently he forged a baseball and sold it and there was a $7,000 lien on the house. I bought that house subject to that lawsuit, subject to that lien. And uh, then what I did is uh, I called up the attorney later on who had the lien and basically explained to him, look, uh, I'm not the one who forged the baseball, and I'm not the one, who, uh, certainly the house didn't forge the baseball, so you can continue to pursue your, <clears throat> your uh, lawsuit against this person and I offered him $1,000 to remove the lien from the house, and he agreed. So the point is, you don't just pay things off. 
it, it, it's not only a great technique to buy houses, but it's a great technique to uh, eliminate some additional expenses that most people just walk into settlement and accept as this must be paid off, and I'm telling you, it doesn't need to be paid off. And when, when you buy a rental property, and they say it's a duplex, and it has leases on it, you're basically buying that house subject to those leases, aren't you? Sure. You must, yeah, you, you, you got to honor those leases, right? You bought the house with the lease. Same thing if there was an option on a house. If somebody had a first right of refusal, uh, you could buy a house subject to that. So there, the point is, is that, you know, leases, options, everybody's bought things subject to. They just don't realize it. You know, essentially, subject to is a form of seller financing. The seller is the one who obtained the mortgage. The seller is the one whose name is on it. And you're simply uh, making a deal with the seller to take over that financing. Okay. Well, I guess we need to address the the 800-pound elephant in the room because one of the things that you always hear about in regards to subject to is the due on sale clause. Would you mind spending a few minutes talking about that? Uh, You're going to... You're hardly going to ever bring up the phrase subject to that that doesn't come up. Um, Basically, you know, if you read a due on sale clause, and it's easy to find, uh, it's it's a clause that's in every mortgage there is. If you just read it, it's not that long of a clause, and basically what it says is the transfer of property or beneficial interest to the borrower, and if you read through it, the highlighted term that you really want to think about is the phrase that says the lender may at its option require immediate payment in full may the lender may so you know the question is will they call the loan will they ask to be paid off well in 23 years in this business I don't know of a single person who's ever had to do that not a single person you have to ask yourself in this day and age with banks dealing with all of these foreclosures, are they actually going to take somebody who has a performing uh, mortgage and, and where the performing meaning that the payments are being made every month and the bank is actually going to call that loan? Well, first of all, they'd have to stop accepting your payments. They'd have, they could stop accepting your payments, which would then put you in default. And then uh, over the course of a year, it probably would take them a year to get that house back. So let's just, just, just assume for a second that, that the bank does that. Uh, you would have almost a whole year to figure out an alternate solution. If you really like the house, um, go out and obtain conventional financing for it. Get a private lender. Uh, you know, there's various different things that you could do. So if a bank ever did, you know, try to exercise their due on sale clause, you have a lot of options. Let's face it, there, there's no due on sale jail. I mean, basically what it means is that you've violated one of the clauses of the contract. It's not a lot different from, say, if a tenant signs a lease and agrees that they won't move in any pets and then later on they buy a dog. Well, they're in violation of your contract. What are you as a landlord going to do about it? Well, my guess is probably not much as long as they're paying the rent and they're good tenants. So in many cases, you know, it comes down to one thing. The bank may invoke their due on sale clause, my bet is that they won't. And even if they do, which I've never had happen to me and I've never even heard of the case, uh, you have a lot of options. So it really comes down to they have the right to call that loan, but it doesn't mean that they will. Okay, It really doesn't mean that it will. And if you have a plan B in, in place, you're going to have other options should and if that ever happens. That's good stuff. So let me, let me kind of ask, what are, what are some of your favorite ways to find find the deals? Well, uh, you know, if I wanted to say, if I wanted to say go out and, and, and look for houses, a, a lot of my subject to deals, here's some of the ways that I find them, okay? I own my own We Buy Houses store on a major road in uh, in a section of Philadelphia like called Montgomeryville, which is one of the suburbs of Philadelphia. It's a major road. We get like 60,000 cars a day. And I also, so people just walk in all the time. People just walk right into my store. So not many people have a We Buy Houses stores, but if you've never thought of it, it's a great way to find deals, I'll tell you. 
if you're going to be working somewhere, you might as well be working in a wee house at Stewart with some good road exposure because we probably find at least one deal a month that just walks right in the door. Uh, another way that I find the leads is I have a I buy houses truck uh, where my letters are 18 inches high. You can just about read it from uh, from space on Google on uh, on Google Earth, and uh, you know it's a great advertising method. You know calls come in and they come in, you know you know maybe about once a week. So what's what's perfect about that for me is I like when people walk in my office or call my truck because. Uh, I'm getting calls once a week, and I have time to address those calls uh, in the manner that they need to be addressed. But if I were to, say, do marketing for, uh, you know, subject twos, it's pretty easy. You just, uh, you just buy a list of houses in a neighborhood that you're interested in, and you specifically look for the kind of houses that you're interested in, and you look for deals where they have, a, they have a mortgage on the house, but that they also have a substantial amount of equity. You know, you could decide the percentages on it. Um, typically, you know, I might run a search. If you were looking to buy a house that's strictly subject to, uh, you might want to look for a search for houses that have uh, mortgages no more than 70% of the uh, actual value of the house. And then you'd have to go out there, and the extra money would leave some room for repairs and whatever. But uh, you could drop marketing. One, I, we drop a lot of marketing uh, in, in this area. And I also buy houses in Florida, and I drop a lot of marketing down there. But one of the things I would caution you about that is, one, it costs money. And two, what happens when you drop marketing is your phone starts ringing off the wall. And now you've got to work it. You know, like I just dropped a marketing campaign, 650 pieces. I got 30 phone calls. Right now I'm looking at a desk full of uh, 30 phone calls. You know, I've got to call these people back. I've got to do research on each one of their houses. So if you're going to drop marketing, you need to take into consideration the fact that it's going to cost you some money and that it's also going to cost you time. So, but that's typically the way I would find subject to deals if, uh, if that's what my goal was this month. Okay, and on the when you do drop the marketing, what's your your uh, best results type campaigns? Um, I would say that I I, I get about three percent returns on my marketing, I mean, which I do, think is you do letters, pretty, you do postcards, you you target a certain niche of people, or yeah, I mean uh, the marketing that I use uh, is basically postcards. Um, I'm partnered with a with a guy who I've been working with for uh, for a few years, and um, he's been a student of some of the best marketing courses that money can buy. And um, this, these postcards, these letters, everything that we use is typically marketing programs that were purchased from other real estate gurus over the years. And 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 every campaign gets gets modified for what you're looking for. Um, I wouldn't say that I, I, one of my favorite ways to buy a house is, you know, seller financing. So I might, I might drop a marketing campaign where I'm looking for free and clear houses. But often what happens when people get your card, maybe I, I sent the postcard to somebody whose name appeared on the list that they owned the house free and clear. But what happens almost all the time is, they don't call me back about that particular house. They might say, well, yeah, that's true. I do own that house, but I'm not looking to sell that house. However, I have another house I'm looking to sell. So a lot of times, even if you don't drop marketing for subject to houses, subject to opportunities come up all the time because everybody, almost everybody, you know, uh, two, more than two-thirds, I don't know what the statistics are, uh, in Texas, but uh, in the Philadelphia area, 28% of all houses are free and clear. So even if you drop marketing campaigns to free and clear houses, I can guarantee you that two-thirds of your calls are going to be, you know, houses that have liens already on them, even though that's not what I paid for. So okay. when it comes to marketing, you don't always get exactly what you thought you'd get, so it's important to have a technique for every type of house. Have a strategy for everything. So that no matter when that call comes in, you can figure out a way to monetize it. Okay. So let's, uh, I guess, let's take go to the next step. And so someone's walked into the store, saw your truck, or responded to one of your postcards. How do you go about 
um, analyzing the deal? Well, um, the first thing I would do is uh, I go, say somebody walked into my store, for example. Um, somebody walks in, they say, I have a house at 123 Oak Lane, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Uh, there's several things that I use. I have a, a lead qualifying sheet that I use. Every single time I talk to somebody about a piece of property, I talk to them with this lead sheet in front of me, whether it's on the phone or whether it's in person, doesn't matter. And I fill out this lead sheet the exact same way I fill out for every deal. And I typically, if I'm in front of a computer at that moment, I typically go right on to Google and just type in the address and hit enter, and next thing you know, I'm looking at the house. I'm looking at the neighborhood. If it's in the Philadelphia area, hopefully I'm familiar with that neighborhood. It has a street view, so you can quickly look at the, what the exterior of the house is. I'm also a licensed realtor, so I, anyone can go on Zillow, but I can even go on to, uh, you know, the MLS listings, and I can, in about five minutes, be looking at the inside pictures, have a Zillow estimate of the house. Uh, if I want to run comps on it as a realtor, I, that'll take a few more minutes, but so I, I usually don't go to that point. I usually do, like, a Zillow search. I go to Google. I get a feel for the house, and then I ask the questions that need to be asked. Uh, so some of them would be, I'll just give you some of the important questions that you always want to ask somebody. Uh, you obviously got to get the, their name and the address of the house. And then you want to get, what is their asking price of the house? What is their, what do they think the estimated value of the house is? Because those two things don't always, aren't always the same. And uh, you want to ask them critical question. Is there an existing mortgage on the house? And if so, I need to know what that is. I need to know what their payments are. Now, a lot of times people aren't too comfortable revealing that to you on the phone. You might need to build a little bit of credibility with, for yourself before you get to the point where you're asking that kind of question. But that is absolutely, you know, important information to obtain. If they're not going to share the mortgage information with you, what's the payment? What's the interest rate? What's the debt on the house? Look, I can go to public records and I can find out how much they owe on it. Uh, and I might even be able to find out a little bit more than that. But at that point, if you're going to buy a house subject to, they have to be comfortable with you and share that information with you. Uh, I would also ask them questions about, you know, how much does this house need repairs? If it does, how many how many repairs in dollar values do you think it needs? Ten grand, twenty grand? At least get a guesstimate from them. And I also ask them things like, you know, when do you want to move? And here's a, a really important question. You know, if you're writing down some notes, make sure you write this down. You know, it, it, you got to ask them, you know, would you be willing to sell the house for what you owe on it? Now, if they say yes to this, these questions, and the estimated value is, say, 200 grand, and they owe 150 on it, and it doesn't need any repairs, and you could buy this house uh, literally by taking over the mortgage then it really comes down to a question of will this house cash flow or not. And if it will, you know, at that point, you definitely want to go see the house. So I try to qualify everybody on the phone or in my store. Obviously, if they come to my store, they don't bring their house with them. But very quickly, I can get a good feeling for what kind of a deal this would be and uh, how excited I am about this deal, depending on where it is, what they're, you know, what they owe on it, what they're willing to do. You've got to take their temperature as you're talking to them and kind of, you know, you, you, everybody's heard the expression before, I don't want to buy from motivated sellers. So you have to ask them the kind of questions that allow you to determine how motivated they really are. Okay. So once you, uh, so I guess let me ask a couple of quick questions. One, do you have a certain loan-to-value percentage you don't want to go over? And two, what, what is your definition of, of cash flow? That's acceptable. Well, the, the loan to value, uh, a lot of times what happens with the loan to value is they think that they know what the value of the house is. But I'm, I'm the expert in the business, so I usually determine that, uh, the, that the, well, what I think the value is. So also, same thing happens with repairs. They assume that repairs are going to cost 80 grand. They go look at the house and it's, Maybe it's only twenty-five grand. So, and and they have an idea what they think the house can rent for. I'm the professional, so I know what I can rent it for. So sometimes I don't put 
too much emphasis on the, uh, on the LTV. Um, if I'm buying a house that comes with financing, I'm willing to pay a lot more for that house. Uh, I own a lot of property, and getting conventional mortgages is something I prefer not to do anymore. I like buying houses where somebody provides the mortgage. I like dealing with, with humans as opposed to institutions. So I focus a lot on, well, if you're willing to work with me, if you're going to willing to let me buy this house with the financing that you've already obtained, uh, I'm very interested in this house as long as it, you know, I can cash flow on it. I don't, I don't go crazy worrying about like how much of a percentage of the house am I buying it for? So essentially, what what's the LTV? You know, if I'm if I'm paying a little more for the house, for example, what do real estate investors do today? The bulk of them, they run around and they make cash offers. You know, I'll give you forty cents on a dollar, thirty cents on a dollar, whatever they're going to give. Oh, you want two hundred grand? I'll give you eighty. Right? People get sick and tired of that. The sellers, that is, they get sick and tired of it. Then one of them contacts me. And I say, oh, you owe $150,000 on a $200,000 house. Would you be willing to sell a house for what you owe on it? If the answer is yes, um, you know, I'm most likely, I, I know they're not going to sell for less than what they owe on it. N- not that that's impossible. Sometimes you can get people to bring money to the table. If I really don't want the house, I have said to people before, you know, you're going to need to bring a check for $10,000 to sell them in, and, and that's the only way I'll buy this house. But it, it's a rarity that... Uh, that that's going to happen for you. But it can happen, so it's worth a try. But in most cases, if I can buy the house for what they owe on it, maybe I can get them to pay their own closing costs. But even that is a rarity. So sometimes if you're buying a $200,000 house with a $150,000 mortgage on it, you're also going to have to pay their closing costs because some of these people are in default. They don't have money. They might even need to make up the payments that are in default. So there's a lot to consider besides just the LTV and the price that you're paying for. You've got to consider all these things. What can I rent it for? What are the repairs? And all the other things that I mentioned. Uh, as, far, as far as cash flow goes, you know, I'm more of a guy who does a lot of things by, by feel. I don't, I don't pull out a computer program and analyze deals. I, I've been doing this long enough where I just know when, it, when there's a good deal. Okay, what I call a real deal. Uh, in, in the circles of investors that I hang around with, they say, what kind of deal did you buy this month? I say, I bought a real deal. That means, you know, a deal that really kicks butt. But uh, generally speaking, a house has to make a minimum of $200 a month. Uh, or it's, and, and even at 200 a month, that's a break-even deal in most cases, meaning that some years I might make some profit. Other years I'm making I'm making nothing I'm losing money but over the course of the years that I own it, it it's a break even deal you know if it's a duplex you know I definitely want to get at least three hundred a month more like four and, and it goes up as there's more units I want uh, benchmarks of you know one hundred and fifty dollars a unit at least uh, is a good benchmark to work off of so. But, but again, when it comes to cash flow, I don't have any set rules. It, it, it's the whole picture altogether. One thing for sure, if I'm using my cash, the deal has to be much better than these margins I'm discussing here. But I'm willing to do deals that have lower cash flow and higher LTVs if the owner is providing the financing with the purchase of the house. Okay. That's good. Good answer. Um, so let me ask. Do you, uh, when you go out to actually, you find a deal that, that looks promising and you go out, I assume you go out to check out, check it out to see what, you know, what you think the repairs will be. Do you do all that yourself or do you have inspectors or appraisers or? Yeah, I, I do it all myself. Uh, I basically, uh, just guess at things. I, I did a lot of construction in the first 10 years I was in this business. I couldn't afford to pay anybody to do anything. So I had to learn how to do construction myself. And when I bought a house, when I was in my 20s, I bought a house. The only guy who was fixing that house for me. So um, I learned a lot about this business as far as construction and repairs go because I came up in the business as a construction guy. Uh, nowadays, I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. But I, I, I'm a little bit of a risk taker. I gamble a little more than, than some people. But... What I gain for doing that is I'm much more efficient. 
So I can walk into a house and I can quickly assess, and this house is about 25 grand in repairs. And various people will argue with me, uh, but I, I've got a pretty good record. I've been wrong before, but for the most part, my numbers are, are good guesses. And it's just something that comes with experience. I do have some, um, uh, th there is some websites out there and some, some forms that you can acquire that can help you do things. Um, Home Depot has a website where you can, uh, I think it's a Home Depot contractor site. I haven't been on it in a while. But it has numbers like if you look at a bathroom, it'll give you a figure like what would it cost to renovate a half bath? Well, that might be three grand, and a full bath might be six grand if you're doing a rental grade. You know, so there's there's things out there if you look on the internet, you can find things to help you estimate repairs. But I kind of shoot from the hip on on most of that stuff, and because it works for me. If I ended up doing a deal where I lost ten grand because I underestimated the repairs, I'd probably get more accurate. But my system kind of works for me. So. All right. Are there any other, any other steps that you take to determine if a specific property is a deal or not? Well, it's really just, uh, you know, asking the right questions. You get in front of a seller and uh, you have their attention. And if they're motivated, you've really got to just think the deal through. Like, one of the... I'll give you some of the objection handling that comes up a lot that we didn't talk about. Um, you know, you asked me the question, what about the due on sale calls? Well, that's a big, big thing for somebody who has a mortgage in their, in their name. They're very worried about that, you know. Uh, so the first thing I show them is I pull out the, the new HUD-1 that the government's uh, put out there. And if you look on line 203 of a, of a HUD-1, it says right on there, existing loans taken subject to. So... It makes people feel more comfortable when they see that because it immediately shows them, hey, not only is this a legal technique, but it's endorsed by the government. Here it is. It's right here. And I can't tell you how many times realtors will be involved in a transaction and they'll say, I never heard of that. Or uh, title companies will say, I've never done one of those. I can't do that. So when you do subject to deals, not a lot of people know about them. It is a legal technique, but... A lot of real estate professionals don't really know about it. They haven't learned this strategy. So you end up having to educate a lot of people that you work with. So, like, let me give you some of the things. You know, why would somebody sell subject to? You know, you need to understand that because if you're going to convince somebody to sell their house to you, subject to, you need to understand what to say to them when those questions come up. So what happens to me a lot is I'll find a house where... They're in pre foreclosure stage, meaning that they're they're a few months behind in their mortgage payments, and uh, they're facing the fact that they might lose the house. It might become a share of sale, it might become a foreclosure, it might become a short sale, whatever it's going to become. They're looking at some pretty uh, negative alternatives, and when somebody's looking at the fact that their credit's going to be destroyed and they're going to lose their home, you know. A guy like me coming in and saying, hey, I'm going to take over your mortgage and I'm going to make your mortgage payments, it may not be the, uh, the, the dream way that they intended to sell their house, but what it is is it's the least worst option, okay? That's a great phrase I like to use when I'm talking to people. I sympathize with them. I understand their problems, but I'm giving them the least worst option, okay? Make them think about their alternatives, you know, basically, I discuss that with them. I say, you know, you're, you're most likely facing foreclosure. What's that going to look like on your credit report? You're already behind two months in paying your mortgage. I'm going to bring your mortgage current at settlement, right? And then I'm going to make your payments from here on out. And guess what that's going to do for you, Mr. Seller? That's going to improve your credit. If I pay a mortgage that's in your name, right, I'm going to improve your credit. And so, so once they get the handle on that and understand what's going on here is that we're really helping each other. I'm helping them because they need to sell their house. They're helping me because they're providing me a home with financing already, which is a way I like to buy houses. So it's a win-win. There's definitely concerns, but a good salesperson 
that you're an honorable individual who, who does business in a professional manner. I like to say, know me, like me, trust me. Uh, first thing I want them to do is I want them to get to know me. I want them to, uh, to hopefully like me, and then as time goes on, trust me. And I have many ways that they can trust me. I can, I can give them references of people I've done subject to deals with, and I say, hey, call this person and ask them. Uh, I can give them credit reports. I can take them around to see some of the buildings that I own. I own some, some large apartment buildings and some office buildings, and they give me great credibility. Often what I'll do with somebody is if, if I go to someone's house to buy their house, I'll have a meeting with them, and they're not prepared to sign the documents at that point. But the next meeting, I have them come to my office building. I own a beautiful office building that's worth a couple of million dollars. And it's very impressive. And I walk people around and I go, you know, if, if, you know, I, I'm a real guy. I buy houses. I buy buildings. I'm an honorable individual. If I tell you I'm going to make you a mortgage payment, I'm going to do it. So if you have any credibility in your life, you, you want to you wanna talk to people about that because that's important. I'll tell you quickly about this uh, story about this um, credit. I had a woman who um, I was buying her house subject to. And she was very, very uncomfortable with the process. And this house needed a, a lot of work, so I was going to a private investor to borrow money to get the house renovated. It needed like 80 grand in work. She was really uncomfortable with the subject to process, so uncomfortable that even at settlement, she was, you know, hemming and hawing whether she was even going to sign the papers. And I said, she said, you need to promise me that you're going to get this loan out of my name in six months. And normally I don't buy houses... Uh, where I have to refinance the loan in six months, why would I? I, I? I could just do that, you know, myself right up front, then it'd be easier. But in this particular case, I really wanted this person's house. So I agreed to do it. And uh, I went to the private investor who was giving me the 80 grand, and I got him to pay off the uh, $60,000 subject to mortgage. She called me up about a week after the loan had gotten paid off. And she says, I don't know if she paid off the loan. Jeez, I wish you didn't do that. I said, you made, I said, you made me promise it's something to do it. I kept my word. She says, yeah, but I didn't realize that by you paying the mortgage, you were improving my credit, you know, and, and maybe I screwed up. I should have discussed it with her more, but I, I was too busy working on odd deals. I didn't think to call her. And what happened was she was very uncomfortable with it at settlement. Six months later, she was wishing that I didn't pay it off. So people get more comfortable with it if you pay they have many benefits. Um, n another objection that comes up is they want to know, you know, what kind of security they have. Like, you know, what's going to happen if you don't make the payment? So in some cases I tell them, well, you're not paying it now. You're in default. So I'm certainly not going to – I'm a businessman. I'm going to make – I'm in this deal to make money. I'm not going to bring you current on your mortgage and then – and then not follow through and make the payments. That doesn't make any sense. Another thing that, that people will ask you is, um, you know, they're just concerns about whether or not you're going to pay. You know, they typically, mortgage companies have 800 numbers, and they can call right now every month and find out if the payment was made last month. And when, you know, we've all heard those automated messages, you know, you have a payment coming up on, on June 1st, and, so I always tell people, well, you could call the 800 number to check on me. Sometimes I've even gone as far as to offer people, you know, I'll send a check made out to the lender. I'll send that to the seller every month. And then the seller can then mail those in. I prefer not to do that, but I've offered it before uh, in order to get a deal done. Okay. That's all great information, Phil. Let me, let me ask uh, a question. What would, what would make you walk away from a deal, if anything? Um, well, you know, I walk away from probably 19 out of 20 deals for all different kinds of reasons. Uh, and a big part of it has to be that uh, I have to feel comfortable that the seller is okay with this. You know, I wouldn't recommend doing subject to deals unless, you know, the person is comfortable with it. So you have to disclose, disclose, disclose. You have to let them know, look, there is a due on sale clause here. You are violating your your mortgage, you know, by by uh, agreeing to this kind of arrangement. And 
you just have to explain it to them that uh, they're transferring the property with the deed. You, I'm going to get the deed. I'm going to be the owner of the property, but the mortgage is going to remain in their name. And uh, I'm basically buying the house with all the liens and encumbrances, uh, except for the, all the liens and encumbrances being resolved, that settlement, except for the mortgage. I'm basically buying the house with dirty title. We need to discuss that with them over and over and over again until they're absolutely comfortable with it. Uh, because you certainly don't want someone coming back to you later on and saying, you know, I didn't even realize that I sold the house. And that has happened. That's why, um, you know, there's some important things that I'd, I'd like to discuss. If we have the time, I'll go over some other important things that I uh, I think are really interesting to, to note when you're buying a subject, too. Okay. Do, we, do we have time, Tim? Yeah, let's jump into that right, right now if you, if you want. Okay. All right. Um, Here's some, some bullet points I made I wanted to share with the, with the crowd. Uh, first of all, uh, I tend to buy my properties in trust. Um, I, use, I use trust instead of, say, LLCs. One of the reasons I don't buy an LLC is because you have to advertise, you have to clarify the name with the state, you have to pay money, you have to follow all these requirements. And when you're buying a trust, especially when you're buying subject to, there's a few things that you can do. Like, let's just say, for example, that the, um, the house you're buying is owned by Mr. Smith. And when I create a trust, I can name the entity whatever I want. So I might name that entity um, Smith Family Trust. Now, why is that important? Because I'm going to have to deal with the mortgage company uh, over the years, and I'm also going to have to get insurance on this property. And by naming the entity the same as the last name of the individual who owns it, it makes the mortgage companies and the insurance companies feel more comfortable. Maybe they think that I just transferred the property into a trust or that the owner, Mr. Smith, transferred the property into a trust. It doesn't ring any alarm bells that the house was sold subject to. Quite frankly, I think that Subject twos are being done often enough that mortgage companies and insurance companies know about subject twos, but at least if the name is on there, it makes the thing go a little smoother. Um, you know, <clears throat> so what does a what does a trust do for you? Well, it, it segregates uh, each house that you buy. That's really important, really important, because let's just I'll give you an example in Philadelphia. Um, the city of Philadelphia was sending fines to uh, a rental property that a friend of mine owned. And uh, he never got the fines because the, uh, because the tenant was just throwing them in the trash. Okay? So the fines for trash were going in the trash. And uh, he never knew about it. He never got it until one day he goes to sell a house that he owned in his personal name. And uh, here's this $10,000 fine. The city of Philadelphia says, look, you, know, you own a fine on a different house. But they, what they did was they enforced the lien on every house that he owned because he owned them all in his individual name. So the reason I buy in trust is because, and it's important when buying subject two, I just gave you the reason why with the names, but there's also other benefits to it. Like every house is owned by this one's Smith Family Trust, next one's Jones Family Trust. And what happens is, you know, uh, it's very difficult for entities to find out how much other properties I own. So it gives you a little bit of liability protection from that standpoint. Even though the trust itself doesn't give you liability, what it gives you is privacy. Let's just suppose that a guy walking down the street at the Smith Family Trust property slipped and falls. He goes into a lawyer and he says, you know, I just slipped and fell in front of this property. Well, the lawyer's going to do a quick search and he's going to find out that uh, the property is owned in trust. Now, the lawyer is probably still going to take the case, but he's not going to take it for free now because he's got to do some investigating work. He's going to have to do some upfront work to find out who owns that house. So he might say to the, uh, to the person who slipped and fell, you know, uh, I need a $5,000 retainer to, to take this case. Now, if the person, if this is a frivolous, if it's a real lawsuit, they'll probably go through with it. But if it's a frivolous lawsuit, they're going to say, you know what, I don't think I fell in front of that house. I think I fell in front of a different house. So it does give you some, the trust gives you some liability protection. 
And specifically, I'd use it on every kind of deal I do, but definitely on subject two, you want to have it. Um, some other things that uh, are important is, you know, the paperwork that's involved when you're buying a trust and handling the insurance. Uh, one of the things that can be difficult is getting insurance on the property. Several reasons why. If I go to an insurance company and I say, uh, I'm the trustee of Smith Family Trust, and I just bought this property, uh, the, the mortgagee and the name of the uh, individual who I bought that property from, Mr. Smith, still has to be on that insurance company, still has to be on that insurance policy. And you certainly don't want the check going to them if there was ever a fire on the house, but at the same time, their names need to be on there because there's an existing lien with that mortgage company. So there's some uh, paperwork there that you need. You know, you can't just do subject twos without having the proper paperwork that you need to get the uh, to get the insurance policies resolved. Typically, what we do is we will uh, we'll have the uh, the insurance in the name of Smith Family Trust, and Mr. Smith's name name might be listed on that um, paperwork, but the uh, the address for which we send everything to goes to a, uh, a mailbox that I have assigned in, in one of my office buildings. And it gives me some control over what's going on there. So some of the paperwork that you need when you do a, um, a subject two is you, know, you need an agreement of sale that has a special subject two clause where you're defining very clearly, very, very clearly what their existing loan is that you're agreeing to pay. You know, what is the payment per month and you're agreeing to pay it. And it has a subject to disclaimer in that agreement of sale, which essentially holds you harmless, that you've, you've notified them, that you've told them about the due on sale clause, that they understand how this transaction is going down. And you also have to get um, them to uh, sign a document which notifies the mortgage company that I am now going to be managing this property and making the payments because now the statements have to come to me. And then they also sign documents notifying their insurance company that the statements have to come to me, Smith Family Trust, uh, Trustee Phil Falcone. And uh, I also get them to sign a limited power of attorney, giving me the power to uh, deal with the mortgage company and the insurance company and anybody else for that matter as, as it regards to this particular property. It's the same as if you hired a property manager to manage your property and do all the bookkeeping for you, that person, that manager, would need these notices to the mortgage company, to the insurance company, They'd need the limited power of attorney. Okay? And another thing that I do is I always get the deed. Don't ever buy a house subject to without getting the deed. You've got to get the deed. And you also want to always have an official closing at a settlement company. Uh, just in case, you know, down the road someone says, well, geez, you know, I didn't realize what was going on here. You can have all this documentation. You know, you never want to do like a kitchen table closing. It is theoretically possible that you could sit at somebody's kitchen table and buy their house just by having them sign some subject to documents and getting it notarized. I would not recommend that. You want to you want to have a settlement where everything is recorded at a title company, where everything is, is done legitimately and accurately, and, and they, they, they sat there, and there's no question about it that they had sold their home, that there's a handing of the keys over in front of multiple witnesses. I've never had anybody come back and, and, and complain about the deals I've done, but if you do these improperly, you could get yourself in some trouble, just like anything else. There's some risk involved in it. Okay. It's all great information. Um, looks like we got about 10 minutes left or so. Do you want to talk about how you go about, um, on the back end, how you uh, sell, sell the properties or lease the properties? Right. Well, I mean, my back end philosophies are, are really I'm a buy and hold guy. So, um, you know, if you need money, like most of us do, you're going to, you know, you can wholesale deals and you can flip deals. And I do, I do a little bit of that. Uh, but typically... Um, I would, most of the time, I'm buying and holding. So here's the way I would get paid on a house, okay? Because I need to make, I want to buy houses. I want to build up the biggest portfolio humanly possible. That's my goal in life. 
but I also have a family and I need to feed them and I don't have a full-time job. So how do I get paid on every deal, at least something? Well, one way I do is what I call wholesaling to yourself. Let's just suppose that I had to bring in, like I bought, let's, let's go over the example where the woman wasn't comfortable with the deal. I bought a house subject to a $60,000 mortgage and it needed $80,000 in repairs. So I brought in a private lender. Now, when I went to that private lender, I didn't ask him to lend me 140 grand. I asked him to lend me 150 grand. Now, the house was worth about uh, 260. So he was comfortable doing that because there was plenty of equity above it. It was going to be worth 260 at least when the repairs were done. So what I call wholesaling to yourself, I simply told the private lender, uh, I need to borrow 10,000 extra dollars. And, and, and he says, well, what's that for? And I said, well, you know, you know, I don't have a job. This is how I earn my living. And in order for me to do this deal with you, I have to have income coming in. Otherwise, I can't just buy houses where I don't make any money. So that would be a way I can make money off of it. You could take over a house subject to and sell it to somebody as a wholesale deal, but you better make sure that the person buying it is going to be buying cash and paying off that subject to mortgage. I mean, uh, there are some people who do strategies that are out there where they buy something subject to and sell that subject to note to somebody else. I am absolutely not comfortable with that strategy. So if I was going to wholesale a subject to house, they'd have to replace the financing and pay off that initial financing because I made a commitment to that person that I would pay their mortgage, and I cannot guarantee that the person buying is going to pay their mortgage. So that's something I don't typically wholesale subject to deals. I could flip them. I could fix them up, put them on a market for sale, and flip them, and I've certainly done that. Uh, but in today's economy, I'm trying not to do retail flips, that's for sure. I'm trying not to. Because they sit a long time, and it's, you know, you could still flip today. I'm just saying it depends. It better be a strong deal. You better be getting it for an amazing price. So my, my favorite way to pull money out of a deal is to uh, wholesale it to yourself. Think about that for a second. I'm getting paid, and I get to keep the house, right? One of my strategies, my, my slogan, if you want to call it that, is I say, people go, well, how do you buy houses, Phil? I buy houses with none of my own money, without the support of banks, I get to keep the property, and I get paid to buy it. Well, wholesaling, say I took over a property subject to, and then I, uh, I kept the property and I wholesaled it to myself. Right? I didn't use any of my own money. I went to a private lender for everything. I didn't go to a bank, so I bought the property with none of my own money without the support of banks. I get to keep the property because I still have the asset. I didn't sell it, and I didn't flip it, and I didn't wholesale it. Right? I still own it. And I got paid to buy it. So it was like the best of everything, right? That's, that's what I love to do. That's my favorite exit strategy there. It, it doesn't matter how I do it. As long as I'm buying it with none of my own money, without the support of banks, I get to keep the property, and I get paid to buy it. That's my exit strategy. Okay. So let me ask, do you, um, how do you go about finding uh, tenants for, the ones, for these ones that you keep? Uh, I, I don't know about what's going on in your area, but around here, uh, tenants, finding tenants has never been easier. I mean, you know, all the usual stuff. I put signs out front. I advertise on Craigslist. I, uh, I put them up on the MLS. I uh, make videos about them. I do a lot of video marketing. You know, make a video of the house, put up pictures of the house, throw it up on websites, uh, various websites, get it out there. So finding tenants is really more like just work that needs to be done. I wouldn't say there's anything challenging about it in this day and age. Okay, so no big deal? No, nah, no big deal. Not around this area, that's for sure. Uh, okay. Do you still, are you still primarily doing everything yourself, or do you have some key players that help you? I know you mentioned some other, other people were involved earlier. Yeah, uh, well, I, I try not to hire employees. I, I like to get done as much as I can. I do a combination of a lot of things. I do have a... Uh, full-time property manager that works for me, it's an employee of mine, manages my properties, I have uh, several, two secretaries who do various tasks for me, answer the phones and lots of other things. I have a partner who I work with a lot who is an incredibly talented guy, and we, have a com we both have uh, virtual assistants that we use uh, from the Philippines that work very cheaply and do a lot of stuff. I also have a uh, marketing guy who does a lot of work with me on some things that I'm developing, and uh, he's he's you could call him like an employee. He's like a he's like an equity partner. I've given him a stake in some of the things that I'm doing. So I have a team of people around me 
Uh, truth is, I could use a few more. I just, uh, I, I, I have to be careful to hire employees uh, today. So I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with the economy, what happens with the uh, with the election coming up this year. Those are the things that I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see how they shake out before I go out and hire a bunch of employees. Sure. Okay, so let me ask, do you, uh, do you try to make a certain number of offers per month or do you just kind of take it, take it based on your current workload or how does that work? Um, um, I'd say in any given day, I'm probably looking at four or five deals a day. When I say I'm looking at them, I don't mean I'm physically there looking at them, but I'm analyzing four or five deals a day. And... At this point, you know, I'm buying at least at least one house a month. I'd like to get that number up to uh, to three or four, uh, but I haven't figured out how to do that without working myself to death. So um, <laughs> maybe maybe you got an idea for that. I'd love to hear it. Uh, I think after this long, you probably have it. How do you like it? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely feel one thing is that the window is open right now for some of the greatest deals you're ever going to make in your life. So I feel a lot of pressure right now to buy, 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 buy as much as I can. I just I just want to grab it now. I know I'm going to regret it later on. Jeez, I bought 20 buildings during that time frame. I wish I bought 100 of them. Right. So, you know, that's kind of my mindset, and I'm... I just feel like if I can somehow work hard enough to buy as much as possible right now, I'm going to be thrilled that I did down the road. Well, let me ask, what are some of the tasks that you do daily to kind of grow and improve your business? Uh, I'm actually trying to remove tasks from myself. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to focus strictly on the analyzing of deals and talking to sellers. That's really what I want to be doing most of the time. I'm trying to delegate everything else. Um, so I, I'm, I'm more of, I'm in, I'm in a remove tasks mode. I'm trying to, I, I think the most efficient way to use my time is to be on the phone with sellers trying to make deals or be in front of sellers, looking at physically sitting with sellers and trying to make deals. Because that's how I make my money. If I don't, I make money when I buy. So if I don't buy, I'm not making any money. And uh, I guess maybe, let me back up real quick. When on the, on the properties that you're buying, you said it's no no problem to find tenants. So are you typically not even going? You don't personally have to make any payments on your own because by the time the next payment comes around, you've already got somebody installed. No, I mean uh, usually if the house needs repairs, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to make a payment or two. Um, but once you know, there's gonna be a little bit of loss of money there. Uh, once once the tenant is paying though, and the tenant's in position, then obviously uh, I'm I'm good. And, and what I do, um, I buy all these houses in individual trusts. But the owner of all these different trusts is a, another corporation that I own, which is like a layered corporation, you know. And 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 so I have a bunch of properties that are all being paid out of one bank account. All the mortgage company, all the mortgage companies are being paid from this corporation. So what happens is. Just like any portfolio, I might lo- be losing money on uh, several of the buildings, but the other 50 buildings are, are, are covering everything. So there's a little bit of give and take like that with properties. You know, if you manage a, a large enough portfolio, everybody experiences that at some point. You got you got some properties that are cash flowing great. You got other ones that aren't cash flowing at all, and it all balances out at the end. Okay, that's good stuff. Let me ask. Um for someone that were uh, was just starting out, what are three to five action steps that you would recommend they they take first? One thing I uh, always tell people is call the signs. Call the signs. What signs? The signs, man. The signs. You drive by them every day. Call the uh, we buy houses signs. Call the for sale by order signs. Um, <coughs> Call the realtor signs. Call the commercial realtor signs. Call the signs. Start talking to people. So the main thing I tell people is you never, a lot of people are apprehensive about getting involved in this business. And I say, you know, just, just call the signs and, and, and talk to people. Because what happens is as you talk to people, you get better and better at negotiating and you hear yourself saying things and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. And you kind of figure it out as you go, 
And over the years, that's how I learned. You can't really go to school for this stuff. You can't uh, you can't go to college and learn how to buy houses. Um, you have to kind of learn it at the School of Hard Knocks, or you can buy some guru's package. But I've learned most everything I've done through through guru's packages and through from doing it. So I say you got to get out there and do it. And uh, you know, in order to close one by yourself, you're going to need to know the proper contracts and things like that. So. You know, I do recommend, uh, you know, working with people like, like the REI Club where you guys have a great website, you have great information out there. That's how I um, ultimately got on this call with Tim is I learned about the REI Club from watching some of the material that you guys had out there, and it's terrific stuff. And it, it got my attention, even though I'm an experienced investor. Uh, I learn things from, from every time I watch one of your webinars or, you know, listen to some of your stuff. So you guys do a great job. Appreciate that. Well, I guess um, probably coming to the top of the hour here. Any, any last uh, last minute thoughts you want to leave people with? Uh, just to tell people that you got to get busy buying. You know, if you're if you're on this call or if you're thinking of if you're listening to this CD and you're thinking about buying real estate, don't wait. Get busy buying. You know, the window of opportunity here. It's open for only so long, and you're probably never going to get a buying opportunity like the buying opportunity you have at this moment. So I am not preaching to you anything I'm not doing myself. I'm addicted to real estate, and I live and die by making real estate deals, and I'm absolutely loving the deals I'm making today are the best deals I've ever made in my life. Well, Phil, you've got, you've shared a lot of great tips and resources and strategies with the listeners today. I know that they're very appreciative, as, as I am as well. Would you be willing to provide your contact information so folks that have additional questions can get in touch with you? Sure, sure. The, uh, the best way to get in touch with me is I have a uh, wonderful website. It's addictedtorealestate.com with the number two, addictedtorealestate.com. And if you go to that website, I have all kinds of uh, information there that I provide for people. I have a book there that I wrote, Addicted to Real Estate. I have a web TV show that I produce called Addicted to Real Estate TV. If you put your name and email address in there, you can you know, you can get these shows sent to you. You can watch some of them on the website. So that would be the best way I can help people. There's plenty of ways to contact me on there. There's a contact tab if you need some help. I'll try to help you out. And uh, I want to thank you for having me on this call today, Tim. I enjoyed talking to you. Okay. Well, again, Phil, I, I appreciate it. And I, I know you're a busy guy. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to share all this information with the listeners. And to the listeners, we, we also appreciate, appreciate you. We know you have a choice in how you spend your time, and we appreciate you spending it with us. This is Tim Randall with REI Club signing off. Good investing to you all.